the, the people who surround you are the people who shape you. And um, that's something that the disciples are learning as they follow Jesus. So uh, in our Bibles, we're going to be in Luke 9. And it's kind of neat we talk about first steps and, and uh, pathway to growth because as I was preparing for this and I was praying over like God, help me to, to find a really great way to communicate uh, your, your word. And um, all of a sudden, the song Life is a Highway came to mind. Now, I'll admit, I have never listened to Rascal Flats in my life. I only know this song from a movie. Can you guys guess that movie? Yeah, so we're going to follow Lightning McQueen through this uh, message this morning as we look at how the disciples are, are growing and learning what it means to really follow Jesus. And when you think about the movie Cars, and it's, um, don't worry, it's 14 years old. If there are any spoilers, it's your fault you haven't seen it in the last 14 years. And... Um, Blaine McQueen, he's a hotshot race car, and he's all about himself. In the opening scene, we learn that he's fired three crew chiefs, and he's still only a rookie. Uh, he tells uh, the, the news person who's interviewing him that, you know, I'm, I'm a one-man show. I'm, you know, I just thought it would be really great to win the final race by almost an entire lap. But, of course, he blows two tires trying to do that and then ends up in a three-way tie, embarrasses himself, and his entire team quits on him. And we know Lightning McQueen has some issues. And so um, he's trying to get the top sponsor, and he tells his truck, Mac, hey, I want you to drive all night all the way to California. And eventually he takes a wrong turn and ends up in Radiator Springs. It's, it's a happy place. And it's while he's here that he realizes his life has changed. He's at a crossroads. And he's got to ask himself, am I going to keep doing what I've always done? Or am I going to learn to do things differently? <clears throat> and if you know the movie, he wrecks the town and uh, they, they bring him to traffic court and they force him to fix the road. And he does a horrible job. And he's not a happy camper. And finally, old Doc Hudson says, tell you what, one lap, one race, you beat me, you go, you go free. I beat you, you paved the road my way. So you have this rookie race car who is about to win the championship versus a 55-year-old senior citizen. Who's going to win this race? Well, if you've seen the movie, you know that this 55-year-old car wins. And later in the movie, Doc tells him, this ain't asphalt, son. This is dirt. You don't have three-wheel brakes. You've got to pitch it hard, break it loose, and then just drive it with a throttle. Give it too much and be out of the dirt, into the tulips. I'll put it simple. If you're going hard enough left, you'll find yourself turning right. And then Lady McQueen goes, turn right to go left? Turn right to go left? When you're driving on dirt, yeah. When you're following Jesus, you turn right to go left. And that's our slogan for this week. When we follow Jesus, we have to turn right to go left. Because if we don't, then like Lightning McQueen, we'll make the wrong turn. We'll end up off the track and into the cactus. And so if we you can, go ahead and open your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. And we're going to see how the disciples are beginning to realize that they're not driving on pavement anymore. And instead, they have to learn how to turn right to go left. Luke 9, starting in verse 37. If you have everybody stand with me in honor of God's word. On the next day, so remember this is right after they've come down from the mountain of transfiguration that Pastor Jeremy talked about last week. So it's the very same scenes. We have to keep everything in the narrative so far kind of in the back of our minds. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. And behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And, and behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him and will hardly leave him. Jesus, I, I begged your disciples to cast it out, but, but they could not. And Jesus answered, Oh, faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. 
While he was coming, the demon threw the son to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. But while they were all marveling at everything he was doing, Jesus said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying. It was concealed to them so that they might not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask about this saying. And so an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives him Me receives him who sent me, for he who is least among you all is the one who is greatest. And at this point, John responds, But master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him, because he doesn't follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not stop him, for the one who is not against you is for you. Lord Jesus, we come humbly and we ask that your spirit would help us to see and to perceive and to understand and to ask the right questions as you open our eyes in this text to the way that your kingdom works. God, I pray that you would help us learn to turn right to go left as we follow you in your upside down kingdom. Let it be in your great name, Jesus. Amen. You guys may all be seated. And so... As we look at Luke 9, we see that there's an issue happening. The disciples had just come down from the mountain of transfiguration, and they cannot cast out a demon. And so that's a symptom here of an issue. Just like McQueen firing his crew chiefs and um, seeing his team quit on him was a symptom of a deeper issue. So as we're looking at these symptoms, we have to look for some clues. And if the symptom in Luke 940 is the inability to cast out a demon, then we start to look back and go, okay, is it maybe an authority power problem? Well, in Luke 9, 1 and 2, Jesus had already given them power and authority to cast out demons and to heal. So it's not a power and authority problem. Then we go, okay, so maybe it's a competency problem. Because, you know, some people have power and authority and don't know what to do with it. And, you know, just... You know, if you don't know how to put the wires on a car battery, the car won't start. So maybe it's a competency problem. They don't know what to do. They're not saying the right words. But Luke 9, 10 suggests that they went out into the cities and they did the things that Jesus told them to do and they came back and gave him a report of all they had done. So it's not a competency problem. So what is it? And this is where we need to look for the, uh, what I call the Bible Easter eggs. Uh, If you're a fan of Pixar movies or even the Star Wars movies and Marvel movies, you'll notice that there are lots of little hidden things in the movies that add so much when you pick up on them. And so um, I'm going to ask a question. Have any of you guys noticed uh, Luigi in the the, the Cars movies? Can you see his license plate? The 445-108? Now, in license that you see around here, do they normally have decimal points? Do you know what those decimal points mean? Luigi's license plate is the latitude and longitude of where Ferrari was founded, and they have their famous test track. Now, Luigi is, as we find out later in the show, he's a Ferrari fan. He faints at the end of the movie when a real Ferrari comes into his shop. And with this little detail, which you'll find all over the Pixar movies, just adds that little bit of extra, like, wow, Luigi really loves Ferrari. He's got a personalized license plate for Ferrari. And it's just one of those cool little things. And the Bible is chock full of Easter eggs. The difference is, is that the Easter eggs in the Bible are strategically and carefully crafted and placed within the biblical narrative because they want you to think back to the stories that they're referencing to before and helping us understand the events that we're witnessing in the passage here. And so, do you remember this this image? I've shown this before where um, at the bottom, 
um, all those bars are each individual chapter of the Bible, and they alternate white and gray for the individual books. And every arc is where the Bible, at one point, has an Easter egg reaching back to another part in the story that came before. And so what we're going to do is we're going to trace out some of these Easter eggs to help us understand Luke chapter 9. And the very first Easter egg actually um, was mentioned by Pastor Jeremy last week, and it's the Exodus motif in the um, scene on the Mountain of Transfiguration. Um, not only do you see Jesus up on a mountain the way Moses was up on a mountain, and not only is God's glory manifested through the cloud and through the, the lightning and the fire, um, not only do Moses and Jesus both have um, glowing faces from the glory of God, but Luke is the only one who um, quotes Deuteronomy 18.15 in both his vocabulary and his word order. And Deuteronomy 18.15 is this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And if you remember last week when we were changing our playlist, it is to the Son of God that we now listen to. And so there's those parallels. Another parallel between Jesus on the mountain and Moses on the mountain is when they come down from the mountain, both of them find their followers not doing the things they said. Moses gave them the Ten Commandments. They come down and he sees worship of the golden calf. Jesus says, cast out demons and heal. He comes down the mountain and sees the disciples unable to cast out a demon. And so... These are, these are clues, these are Easter eggs, and we're supposed to have Israel's story of the wilderness in the back of our minds as Jesus is talking to his disciples. And this leads us to Luke 9, verse 41, where Jesus replies, and I always read this thinking he's talking to the Father. He's like, man, that's kind of harsh, Jesus. But actually he's talking to the disciples. And he says, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to bear, be with you and bear with you? And there are two Easter eggs in this, uh, in this statement by Jesus. The first one, um, how long must I bear you, is a concept that Moses is constantly kind of um, reflecting on in the book of Deuteronomy. Right in chapter 1, you see two or three places in Deuteronomy where Moses is saying, and I went to God and I said, how long must I bear with these people? I can't bear with these people. And God uh, rose up 70 elders from Israel to help me lead. And, and then you know, at every kind of point where there was difficulty, Moses turns to God and says, God, really? I have to deal with these people? And God's like, yeah, I know. And that's, so it's wilderness wanderings that we're talking about. The other part of Jesus' statement, O oh, faithless and twisted generation, is actually a direct allusion from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5. And this is where Moses, at the end of Deuteronomy, teaches Israel a song. And to summarize it, it's basically comparing the faithfulness of God and the faithlessness of the people. And if you read that song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, you get to verses 16 and 17, and this is where we see um, Moses writing, The people stirred God to jealousy with their strange gods. With abominations, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons that were not gods. And so here you have Moses who is saying, okay, Israel, because of your idolatry in the wilderness, we know that really you are sacrificing to demons. And yet here in Luke 9, we have Jesus coming down from the mountain, having been revealed as the Son of God and future King of the cosmos. And the disciples are, are powerless against a demon. And all these little Easter eggs start to point to, you know what, there, there's this underlying narrative of idolatry happening. But when you read Luke 9, I don't see a golden calf. Do you? We're getting a lot of shaking heads. So, no. Okay, so now we have to look for some more Easter eggs. You guys ready? All right, Luke 9, 44, the first part of the verse. Uh, after Jesus casts out the demon from the boy, and he turns to... Uh, his disciples, while the crowds are still marveling. And remember, the crowds are always in the background here. It's one consistent narrative. And he says, let these words sink into your ears. Now, this is like Rus the nesting Russian Easter dolls. Have you guys seen those where you take it out and there's a doll and take it out and there's a doll? Um, and then you get to the end, it's this little one. So you take off the first lid and it references directly back to Luke 8. 
where Jesus says, I speak in parables so that those seeing, they may not see, and hearing, they may not hear. And when I spoke on that passage, we see that um, if you take that lid off, that referred back to Isaiah 6, where Isaiah was prophesying a judgment against Israel, saying that because you have served idols, you will become as dumb and as blind and as um, deaf and as mindless as the idols you serve. And when you took that lid off, that takes you right back to Exodus, to Exodus 32 in the golden calf incident, where uh, Moses is directly relating the Israelites to a calf. He's basically saying, you're acting like an untamed, um, an untamed cow. When you read that passage, sorry, that's not in my notes, but that was free. Anyway, um, and this is, these are all examples of what we talked about a couple months ago of sensory malfunction language. And if you look closely at Luke 9.45, Luke tells us four times the disciples didn't get it. He says, they didn't understand, it was concealed from them, they could not perceive and they were afraid to ask. There is something deep in the disciples' hearts that is, that is conflicting with the kingdom of God. So you have a power struggle between kingdoms, and that's what idolatry is. So let's dig out a few more Easter eggs. In Luke 9.44, the second part of that verse, Jesus says, this is, this is what you need to have sink in your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And Son of Man was Jesus is deep in the disciples' hearts that is, that is conflicting with the kingdom of God. So you have a power struggle between kingdoms, and that's what idolatry is. So let's dig out a few more Easter eggs. In Luke 9.44, the second part of that verse, Jesus says, this is, this is what you need to have sink in your ears. The Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men. And Son of Man was Jesus' favorite self-identifier. If, if he walked into uh, First Steps and he grabbed a sticker that said, Hello, my name is, he would write Son of Man. Peter would write the Christ. Um, other people would write Elijah or the prophets or whatever. Jesus would say Son of Man. And we find that phrase first in the book of Ezekiel. And... It's the name that God calls his prophet, and it it's, means this. It recognizes Ezekiel as the individual who identifies with the people of Israel and then serves as their representative before God. At the same time, Ezekiel identifies in his faithfulness to God and serves as God's representative back to the people. It is He's functioning in this bridge-type role here. He's the mediator between God and Israel. And this is the name that Jesus takes on to himself. We, the next time we find it is in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. And this is in the midst of some really crazy dreams that Daniel's having. And after he sees four um, crazy beasts come up out of the sea, and the last one is super, super crazy, he sees... This in uh, verses 13 and 14, where one like a son of man came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And when you continue reading in Daniel 7, you'll see that after this image of one like a son of man you see that, that fourth beast, which is a demonic representation of the oppressive uh, world systems that um, Satan really is behind. So you think about, um, for the Israelites, it would have been the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Roman Empire, the Assyrian Empire. All of these oppressive world um, empires are actually the, have behind them demonic forces. And... <clears throat> It is that demonic power which is waging war against the ancient of days, the one like a son of man, and those who follow them. And in Daniel 7.27, we read in Daniel's prophecy that the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given not to the son of man, not to the ancient of days, but to the people of the saints, 
of the Most High. So wait, is it the Son of Man's kingdom or is it the Saint's kingdom? The second part of Daniel 7.27 is this. His kingdom, the Son of Man, shall be an everlasting kingdom. And what we see is that because the Son of Man both identifies with God and with the people, and those who follow the Son of Man identify both with Him and with each other in relationship, that the kingdom is for both. And that bear, we see that borne out in Revelation uh, chapter 1, Revelation chapter 5, in which the saints who persevere become, are made into a kingship. They function in, under the authority of the Son of Man. And so if we go back to Luke chapter 9 and we read Jesus' statement with this in mind, we see that the, he's saying, let this sink deep into your ears. The Son of Man, the divine representative of God's people, is about to be delivered into the hands of men, the subjects of the beast's demonic kingdom. And it is through this which the beast will be overcome, and the Son of Man and those who follow him receive the kingdom. It's a kingdom battle. It is this upside-down way of understanding what real power is. This is driving on dirt. They're being told you have to learn to turn right to go left. So when we put it all together, we know that Jesus from the mountaintop is revealed in his divine glory. And as he comes down, he's seeing this, um, this separation between what his kingdom is supposed to be and what the disciples' understanding of his kingdom is supposed to be. It suggests that there's a disconnect between the disciples' understanding of who Jesus is, of what kind of king or messiah he is, and what his kingdom is really to be like, and ultimately where their allegiance lies. But again, we don't see a golden calf in the story. Where is it? We find that when we start looking at the disciples' behavior. When... <clears throat> When we look at their behavior, we see that there's this, this change of focus from other, the way Jesus interacts with people, to self. And the idol of one, the, the Israelites in the Old Testament with the golden calf, is just as real as the idol of the other. Sometimes the greatest idol we face is the one that stares at us in the mirror. And we'll see that in the disciples' behavior. And so all these Easter eggs remind us that we're not in the kingdom of the world. We're in the kingdom of God. We're in this upside-down kingdom. We're trying to drive on dirt, and we have to turn right to go left. Or if Jesus were Doc Hudson, he might say it this way. This ain't the world, son. This is the kingdom. You don't have the, the same rights or the same status or the same comforts that you're used to. So you've got to humble yourself. You've got to break social conventions. And then you've just got to love people sacrificially. If you love the world... You're going to be out of the dirt and into the tulips. I'll put it simple. If you're going to follow me, you've got to go right to go left. Or you have to deny yourself, bear your cross, and follow me. And so let's look at what the disciples are doing, and maybe we can uncover a little bit more what's happening in the narrative. And uh, coming back to kind of our, our cars motif, um, Lady McQueen is very self -centered. We've already covered that, but he gets done with that race in the opening scene, and um, he goes to get, to his, get on his trailer, because he wants to get to California in a hurry, and Max missing. He's like, what? Where's my trailer? And I was like, hey, boss, you, you got to make your, your um, appearance for your sponsors. Who remembers Lightning McQueen sponsors? Yeah, Rusty's. What is Rusty's? Medicated bumper ointment. It is the... Um, it is hemorrhoid cream in the car's world. Lightning McQueen is hawking butt paste, people. All right? And then he's, like, he's moping over to the tent, and he's going, oh, I hate rusty cars. And you can tell, like, he feels like he needs a tetanus shot just going into the tent. And, and, the, and you know, there's Fred. And you know Lightning McQueen wants nothing to do with Fred. And he puts on a smile and does his, his prepared speech, and then he gets out as quickly as he can. And in Luke... The rusty cars is one of his favorite themes. But for Luke, it's not Fred. It's the poor. It's women. It's the lepers. It's the tax collectors. The people who have compromised with the Roman powers. It's the sinners, the prostitutes, the Gentiles, the outsiders, the outcasts. It's children. And 
when we look at the disciples' interaction, they're trying to cast out a demon from a child, and Jesus turns to them and says, twisted and faithless generation, how long must I bear with you? He's... And then they go through that. You, you have to understand this is an upside-down kingdom. The Son of Man will be handed over into the hands of men. And then John comes back and he goes, well, but Jesus... Oh, sorry, I skipped a part. And they start arguing about who's the greatest. And this argument is them trying to save face. So they just failed at the very thing they were told to do. Jesus has just rebuked them publicly with the crowd surrounding them. And now they're arguing about who's the best. They are living in the Roman honor-shame worldview paradigm, which is completely contradictory to the kingdom of God. And what Jesus does then is he brings a child next to him. And this is very significant because in that day and age, children were the, no offense, little ones, but they had zero social value and were considered the lowest rung on the social ladder. They had no influence. They had no honor. They had no value. And Jesus takes that individual, puts it in the place of honor at his side. And he said, those who receive a child in my name, to give one who has no honor, the greatest honor, receives me. Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. This was scandalous. It was against everything that Rome stood for. And if you use your imagination a little bit, you can see it's against very much what America stands for. Jesus is turning the social pyramid upside down. And he's showing that the suffering son of man paradigm cannot fit within the Roman honor shame paradigm. And to receive the child in his name means to receive him the way Jesus would. You see, names in the Bible are very important. We kind of talked about this before. But if you think about our modern names, you know, Wesley means from the West. And so people would kind of get tired of saying, John from the West. You know, John from the West. John from the West. And just go, all right, I'm lazy. John Wesley. You know, the, the guy from that side of the tracks. Or... Smith, instead of saying, you know, um, Pete the Smithy, Pete the Smithy, they just came to Pete Smith. Or Miller, somebody who works the, the millstone, instead of going through all that elaborate, it was just Pete Miller. And so when Jesus, the name signified what, the, the nature and character of the individual. And when Jesus said, I receive him in my name, you need to receive him in the nature and character of myself. The one who has given up everything, that I can give everything away. And this is the action on the basis of discipleship, as I. Howard Marshall says. It is because the audience is the disciples that Jesus is speaking to, that Jesus has um, just modeled for them how to receive a child. They are to act under his authority and according to his will in the same way. Or um, D.P. Mostner writes it this way. The disciples are unable to exercise the demon from the child because they have not submitted to the divine voice, the voice from last week. And they cannot submit to this voice because their hearts are bloated beyond response to the child in their midst. They're saying, I'm more important than you, and the only reason I'm casting the demon out of you is because it boosts my status. I'm Jesus' homeboy, and that's going to make me look better. That's backwards. That's not kingdom. They are at base no different from the rest of the twisted, unbelieving generation of the crowd surrounding them. And even when Jesus tries to correct them, they don't understand. And this is where the subheadings in your Bibles don't help, because this is one continuous narrative. Right after Jesus says, those who receive a child in my name receive me, and those who receive me receive him who sent me, the, the, he who is least is greatest. John immediately answers. The scene doesn't change. The setting doesn't change. People don't go away. This is still public conference. John turns around and goes, wait, you just said to receive somebody who has zero value in your name. But we saw somebody who was doing that. They were casting demons out in your name, and we told him to stop because he didn't follow with us. And this is insider, insider, outsider language. They weren't part of the Jesus posse. And so they said, oh, you're not as good as us. You have to stop what you're doing. And Jesus is redefining what it means to follow him. The rusty cars are on Jesus' team. 
just like the Misfits and Radiator Springs became Lightning McQueen's team. And in Cars 2, if you watch, all the cars from Radiator Springs have a 95 decal on them because they're saying, yeah, we've, we are on McQueen's team. We bear that same number, that same name. <clears throat> So the absurdity of this story is that, that Jesus telling his disciples that you are to receive somebody from, with no status in my name was that the disciples are now rejecting somebody who is doing that very same thing. Or as Joel Green summarizes it, the failure of the disciples is represented at its most basic level in this. Jesus had implored the disciples to honor those of no status at all but they have refused partnership with one who did not share the status they assumed for themselves. And as a result, we now see the disciples working against the very kingdom that they are called to proclaim. Now, the good news is that the disciples have this whole journey to Jerusalem, the next seven, eight chapters in Luke, to, to figure it out. And in the movie Cars, you'll remember Lightning McQueen figured it out. Uh, there was a scene where um, tractors are going crazy throughout the town, and he chases one over into the kind of the wilderness, and then in the corner of his eye, he, he glances over, and he sees Doc Hudson, and he gets to watch the famous race car go right to turn left. It's drifting. He's, it's controlled chaos. I, I don't know how to describe drifting, but there it is. So... Um, but you're letting the car lose grip, but you're still maintaining control as you slide around the corner. And that's how you can maintain speed while also maintaining control. And McQueen sees that and he goes, whoa, that was amazing. Doc, you got to tell me all your tricks. You got to show me all this. And, and Doc's a grumpy old guy, so he drives off to the garage and McQueen chases after him. says, no, you got to tell me your tricks. You got to help me be better. I, I want to be a cooler racer like you. And Doc turns around and he goes, son, when have you ever thought about anybody outside of yourself? And that's the climax of the movie. From that point forward, McQueen makes a choice. He begins befriending the people in the town. It helps that the town was nice to him too. But he becomes best friends with a rusty truck. Mater. He starts helping everybody. He buys tires from Luigi. He gets gasoline from Fillmore. He gets night vision goggles from Sarge because, you know, race cars don't have headlights. And he finally gets it. He even learns on the track, so in the final scene where he's about to win the race, legitimately win the race, um, he notices in the corner of his eye the jumbotron, he sees the king wreck, and he slams on the brake, and he stops right before the checkered flag. Chick Hicks goes flying by, does his donuts. Instead, McQueen go, goes back to the king, starts pushing him, and the king says, boy, you realize you've just lost the piston cup. And McQueen answers back, you know, an old grumpy race car tell me once it was just an empty cup. And when we're called to follow Jesus and we're living in this upside down kingdom, the honor, shame um, systems that, that we're coming out of are those empty cups. Or as Jesus said, you, you must lose your life to gain it. It's not worth it to gain the whole world and to lose your very soul. Um, somebody in, in recent history whose life really kind of modeled this is Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela was a leader in South Africa and um, started to become a lawyer. And uh, in the early 60s, he started to be very um, active against South African apartheid, which was systematic uh, racism, which gave uh, disproportionate um, privilege to whites. And um, he was captured, he was uh, put on trial, and he was given a life sentence. He was fighting for the least of these. He was fighting for the people who were considered to have zero status. 
And what makes Nelson Mandela's story so amazing is that after 27 years and he receives his pardon and he's walking out of the gates of the prison, he knows that if I don't forgive, I'm just as much a prisoner now as I am behind those bars. And so he purposely chooses to forgive those who locked him away. And so he fought for the freedom of both those who had zero status and those who were misusing and were abusing their status. And at one point in his life, he says, it is said that no one truly knows a nation until you've been inside its jails. A nation should not be judged by how it treats its highest citizens, but its lowest ones. And later, he writes, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. The kingdom of God calls us to add value to those who are, are what we would consider below ourselves on the social ladder. And that's how we learn to turn right to go left. It's how we learn to drive on dirt. You see, when we follow Jesus, we're going to get dirty. He went to the dirty places. He served the lepers. He served the people who were unclean. He served the people who had medical issues. He served the people who were not like himself. He served the people who had a stigma about them. He served the people who were socially unacceptable. And in Nelson Mandela's case, that was the people in power. He, Nelson Mandela recognized that the people who were abusing status were as much um, bound by that same oppression as the ones that they were oppressing. So we are called to love one another, whatever their status is, because this is the upside down kingdom. And so as we follow Christ, we realize we're no longer on the asphalt of this world and the demonic oppressive systems that define it. Instead, we are on dirt, so we need to learn to turn right to go left. And if we don't, we'll head in the wrong direction and work against the very kingdom and king we profess to serve and follow. Lightning McQueen followed Doc. We follow Christ. So as we close, I want this to sink deep into your ears. The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and those who follow him will be as well. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected. Those who follow him will be as well. He will be killed and on the third day be raised. Those who follow him will be as well. If anyone would come after him, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow him. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for his sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? Let's not chase after empty cups. Let's take a moment. We have some time. And as Michael plays, just take, take stock. What are the things in your lives that you have allowed to define you that in reality are an empty cup? For me, growing up, it was uh, schooling, my grades. In elementary school and in middle school, I would go around and I would purposely show my grades to my, my classmates because you know, I didn't fit in, and so that was a way that I could get ahead. I didn't have many friends growing up. That was an idol in my life that I've had to tear down, I've had to take away. as simple as a car you drive or you, know, you talk to the neighbors on this side because they mow their grass weekly but on this side, yeah, they're once a month it could be, you know, I work and, and we notice that in the cafeteria there's, there's this group of people here the executives and this group of, of people here the line workers and you keep moving your chair over and over because that's going to help me get ahead It could be I'm in a place and you know I, all these people look like me and there's a guy over there that doesn't look like me. In the kingdom of God, we're called to cross those barriers to turn upside down the conventions of this world to reach others for the, for the love of Christ. 
It can even be in our family members. Oh, I hate holidays because this person is there, that person is there. Or I'm ashamed of this person. So I would do this to my brothers. We'd be in school and um, we were different enough in our personalities that nobody really knew we were brothers. And um, I would hear them mock my brothers and instead of standing up for them, I would just stand passively aside because that way I don't have to associate and then you know, the silly things they were doing wouldn't look bad on me. To this day, my brothers and I do not have a great relationship and I'm a part of that. I bow down to the image of myself instead of the image of Christ that he has made them to be. So Lord, as we wrap this up and we take time to reflect I pray would you help us to see all the little deaths that we're called to die because we know that oftentimes it's the hardest deaths are the smallest ones to make they're the ones that make us just slightly uncomfortable the big ones are easy unto you and he smiles over you.
them the way he does. Amen. As a quick reminder, if you haven't done a online communication court or in the card or in the phone app, go ahead and fill those out. Um, I'll be available. Um, and if we have any others who just have a heart to pray for others and you want personal prayer, um, just kind of line up kind of distance along this wall by the mirrors. Um, otherwise, um, everybody, you're dismissed. Have a wonderful afternoon and a great week.